<laughs> Thank you, Grant. So welcome again to Environmental Justice Coalition, meeting number six, July 1st, 2024, 4 p.m. Let's get going. So um, as, as we always just acknowledge, um, appreciate the support from the Climate Commitment Act um, that helps make this work possible. Uh, why don't we move into introductions? And so I'll just um, uh, start with the folks on the screen, if that works. Um, Jenna, you're in my top corner, so I guess we'll start with our staff team and then move our way from there. Jenna? Uh, you're talking. I think the meeting room got muted. Maybe. Yeah, meeting room might be muted. How about now? Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Um, I am getting emails from our team's lawyer as we speak because we have folks in the room using Otter AI, which is an AI note-taking tool, and the reason this is an issue for. Um, these types of meetings is that um, by using those tools, there's a potential violation of the Open Public Meetings Act going on because uh, someone is engaging with this whole group um, without a public notice and without the public being able to see. So our request is that um, we do not use AI note-taking tools during these meetings because um, it puts you as the person uh, using it and if anyone responds to it at risk um, of uh, violating the Open Public Meeting Act, and um, uh, and the consequences if you violate the Open Public Meeting Act are on you. Like you could potentially be fined and things like that. So we we take this really seriously, and why we are raising this. This is a new thing in local government. Um, there, uh, sort of state direction on how to handle um, these AI note taking tools uh, yet to to come, but um, it's. We're taking it serious and we're calling it out as we as we see it. So I have gotten an email so far in this meeting from Patricia and Angela through Otter AI. Um, so I requested that you stop using those tools. Um, and then if you do, it goes to the whole group. Um, even if you know what's happening or not, this, the tools are automatically notifying the whole group um, and inviting us to share your notes. So. Um, our request is that you, you don't use those tools during these meetings. Please take notes in other ways. And um, uh, if you do get, uh, you all probably have the same thing in your email, uh, please do not respond because by responding, you are also then um, engaging with the whole group in a non publicly noticed meeting. So that was my main spiel. Sorry to start the meeting that way, but um, this is like a it's just this new thing that we have to figure out how to navigate in local government and um, that's where we're at. Um, okay, so that's all I have for, for that item. Um, but I think there's some other new people to introduce said, um, on the consultant team uh, that JC can uh, take us on. There is. So let's, let's keep uh, – so thank you for that. So, again, just ask for your um, your your help in, in – in, uh, uh, agreeing with with what Jenna just laid out, as you all know, of course, we do provide meeting summaries. If there's that you're missing or needing, please just let us know, and we can do our best to make sure we're capturing um, insights or capturing notes in a way that is most helpful for you. So let's let's keep moving through um, our introductions. Um, Amy, do you want to say hello? Sure, <clears throat> I'm Amy Koski, and I'm with the Public Health Department, part of the project team, and. Glad to be here with all of you today. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lauren. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I work with Amy at Public Health and I'm helping you all with your community engagement. So nice to see everyone. Great, okay, thanks. And then I, I think folks have, have met Tracy before, but uh, Tracy, do you want to say hello? Hi everyone, Tracy Lunsford. I'll be uh, speaking more to you this time. Yep, we got you officially uh, in, in the mix, Tracy, mm -hmm. today. Thank you for saying hello, Claudia. I believe you are relatively, if not brand new, to most of the folks here. Yeah, I think so. Hi, everyone. I'm Claudia Denton. I work closely with Tracy here at Parametrics, and I'll be working a lot on the GHG reduction sub-element. And hearing more from Claudia um, later in the meeting agenda. Um, Nicole, do you want to say hello quick? 
Yes. Hi, everyone. Nicole helped support the process from Crimson West Side. So great to be here. Thank you. Thanks. Guys. And Grant. Hey, everyone. <laughs> Name's Grant, I'll be taking notes for this meeting. Feel free to email me or uh, DM me if you have any tech issues. Great, thank you. And then, uh, of course, as a reminder, Ben Duncan, your facilitator, let's go back into the room. Uh, let's move to our coalition uh, folks. Monica, can we start with you? Hi, I'm Monica Zazueta, um, EJC and CAG. Um, good to be here with everyone. Thank you, Min. Yes, my name is Min Pham. I'm the uh, EJC member, also the uh, uh, speaking for the Vietnamese community. Thanks, Min. Josh? Josh Jones, Program Director over at Partners and Careers, an EJC member. Sorry for that. My mute button wasn't fast enough. Uh, Jude? Hi, Jude Waite. I'm co-representing the Farm and Food Justice Network. Thank you. Gabriella? Gabriela Mendoza Ewing with Hispanic Disability Support of Southwest Washington. Thank you, Rebecca. Hey everybody, Rebecca O'Brien. I'm with the uh, Free Clinic of Southwest Washington. Good to see you. Good to see you, Laura. Hey everyone, Laura Ellsworth, EJC member. I'm with Council for the Homeless and she, her pronouns. Good to see y'all. Thank you. Um, Alana. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alana Tadella. I'm with the Pacific Islander Health Board of Washington. She, her pronouns. Nice to see everyone. Thank you, Lavita. Lavita, if you're talking to us, you're on mute. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, this, my name is Lavita Morrison. I was trying to look for my name in the list and trying to predict when you're going to say my name. So, sorry, my name is Lavita Morrison. I'm with Odyssey World International Education Services. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and um, and yeah, that's about it. So, nice meeting y'all. Yep, good to be here. Um, Almanja. Velasquez with Fourth Point Forward. Um, EJC member. Pronouns she, her. Thank you. Anna? Anna Karimetan Kurmasias, she, her, ella, EJC, here for Latino Leadership Northwest. Thank you. Tavi? Hi, I'm Tavi, Program Coordinator at iUrban Teen, part of the EJC, go by she, her pronouns. Okay, thank you. Do, do I miss anybody? Did I get everyone? Angela. Hello, everyone. My name is Angela William. Uh, she, her pronouns. I'm here on behalf of Pacific Islander Community Association of Washington, and I'm a part of the EJC. Thank you, Angela. And as I said earlier, I'm on a I'm I'm, I'm on my little laptop screen, so uh, ask for a little grace if I if I miss anyone. Did I miss anybody now, or did we get everybody? Okay. Well, let's keep going. Thanks for moving through introductions. So I'll, I'll be um, brief. You know, we have a pretty straightforward agenda today, uh, really focused on uh, providing some additional opportunity, building off our discussion last at our last meeting to provide some space for folks to um, share with your colleagues the, the work you've been doing around public engagement uh, that have occurred uh, up to this point in time. And then uh, we're going to spend a, a good bulk of our, our discussion moving into the greenhouse gas sub-element. And, and of course, Tracy and Claudia are here today to help move us uh, through those conversations. Mm -hmm. So how we're going to do that, if we go to the next slide and move through our agenda, um, again, we'll, we'll provide some space as we do um, for project updates, space for you all to share any announcements that are relevant uh, for your for your colleagues around the table. We'll build off again what we did at our last meeting. So folks that didn't share last month, uh, we'd love to hear from you uh, and some updates around your engagement, successes, reflections, etc. And then we'll take a brief break before moving into the greenhouse gas sub-element. And there'll be a number of kind of slides that we're working through for introducing your, you, you all to uh, the topics, and we'll create plenty of space for Q&A and discussion uh, we will have public comment um, estimated about 610 tonight. So if there are folks in the audience who are interested in providing input 
to this body. Um, we will ask for for your um, your your interest at that time, um, and then we'll close our meeting and and uh, name next steps. Get you out of here by six thirty. Any questions about what we're hoping to accomplish today? Okay, not seeing any. I'll just uh, make a couple notes uh, for today's purposes. So just for folks' awareness, uh, you all as EJC members are joined as panelists, members of the public as attendees, which means that the members of the public can not engage with members of the EJC outside of the public comment period. Uh, we'll ask that you generally stay on mute when you're not speaking. Uh, we do try to create the, the feeling of being together. So if you can keep your video on, when uh, as much as possible, that helps create some community. I understand it's not always possible. Um, do your best. Um, you can use the raise hand button on the bottom of your screen if you'd like to get in the queue. Uh, I will also accept your human hand as a methodology for letting uh, me know that you're interested in asking a question or engaging in conversation. As Grant said earlier, uh, we will have, uh, uh, he's here and can help with any technical issues that, that might arise. So feel free to email uh, gsimmons at kernswest.com. I didn't see anybody on the phone as of yet, but just as a reminder, uh, if you do end up on the phone, star nine um, can raise hand, star six on mutes. Uh, we do ask that you update your name, um, pronouns if you'd like to share really helpful for us um, as we facilitate. Um, if you need help, you can also ask Grant, but otherwise you can hover over yourself, click on the ellipses, go to rename, and you can rename your, yourself. And then uh, of course, you know, we're here for several hours together. So please, you know, take care of yourself, get up, move around, drink some water, have some snacks. I actually don't have my cheeses here today, unfortunately. So I'll be struggling a little bit, uh, but hopefully you all take care of yourself. Uh, let's keep moving. And then just a couple additional pieces. Um, again, uh, reactions have been disabled from the public side. Um, EJC members, you can always raise your hand with the raise hand button. And then we do have closed captioning enabled. So if that's helpful for your uh, participation, please use the CC or show captions button on the bottom of your screen. And that can help you um, hopefully participate. Let's go to the next slide. Again, I won't spend a lot of time. Again, we've we've been pretty good as a group moving through these, but just to reground ourselves in our uh, guidelines, uh, we we want you to focus on on the topics at hand and uh, on the agenda. Uh, we want to balance time, so just really be thoughtful as you're, um, you know, engaging in conversation, really creating the space for for as many voices around the table. To contribute as possible, and I'll do my best to also facilitate through that uh, commitment. Uh, we do ask that, you know, as things come up in our process, even though it's a relatively quick and we'll show a timeline of topics coming up, that you bring up things as early as possible um, and bring them into the room. Uh, focus on substance, learn from each other, share and respect each other's perspective, listen and speak with perspective. Um, uh, or with respect. And then for chat, you know, we encourage folks to bring things into the room. I recognize the chat can be a helpful feature um, for adding content, but I really am going to ask folks to, to try to avoid as much as possible kind of having substantive discussions in the chat. It's kind of uh, what I would call virtual side talk. It can be really distracting. So I'll just ask folks for that. And I'll remind you if we start getting too chat centric. Okay, let's keep moving. And then um, I will ask for those, as I said earlier, we're going to have public comment about 610 uh, this evening. If you are in the audience and would like to provide uh, input to this group, you can raise your hand and we will call on you at that period of time. It is always welcome. We appreciate folks adding their contributions to this space. We will have this at every meeting. And even though the focus is on the Environmental Justice Coalition, deliberation, discussion, reflection, Q&A, uh, we always include space to hear from folks outside of this room. Um, we'll give more details about the three minute time limit, et cetera, and ask for that respect. But if you are interested, you can raise your hand now. I'll do another call later in the agenda. And then we always have the option for public to provide written input to comp.plan at clark.wa.gov 
or to submit comments online. And I won't read the whole thing, but it's Clark, Washington Gov, Community Planning, Public Plan Comments. We will put that in the chat. Um, we also include it on our slides for every meeting if you're interested. So moving forward, um, as we do at each of our meetings, we provided in the background materials a summary of our last meeting. So I guess I'll open it up if there's any edits, changes, um, or, or comments on the meeting summary from EJC meeting number five. Okay. Not seeing any edits or comments, and this has just been our process, y'all. Like, uh, we ask for any feedback, edits, comments. If not, we uh, consider them approved. So we will um, consider our meeting five meeting summary approved. Thanks. So, Jenna, I'm going to pass it to you for any additional project updates, and then we'll open it up for BJC announcements. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Um, so let's see. I'm just going to run down my list. Um, so as a reminder, in your meeting materials, um, we have some comments that EJC members have submitted since the last meeting, and we also have a few public comments that have come in since your last meeting. So feel free to look at those if you haven't had a chance to already. Um, I also want to thank you all for your progress reports and the feedback that you've been getting to us. Um, from your phase one engagement. Um, we'll talk more about this later in the meeting, but I just want to make sure I don't forget to thank you all. We I mean, you know a lot of work has been going on, um, and we really appreciate um, uh, all the effort that you have been uh, doing with that. Um, for phase two engagement questions, um, all formats are now online um, through your forms and templates webpage. So we've got the questions in Word format as a PDF, and then also we've got a Survey Monkey set up. Um, please reach out to Lauren, Amy, and I if you want um, any assistance customizing them, adapting the questions for your events. Um, we can also make you a unique link so that we can track which responses support through your engagement efforts. Uh, so again, please reach out to us. That's a really quick task for us to turn around for you. Um, so uh, yeah, so anyway, so these two questions are all available. Um, and then I want to talk about phase three engagement questions. We included the uh, next version of those in your meeting packet. Um, these, uh, this version includes the feedback we received from the last time we shared it. Um, and so we are asking if you have any additional feedback on those phase three engagement questions, if you can send that to Lauren, Amy, and me by uh, July 12th, um, that would be great so that we can then um, send those off for translation as well. So we expect to have phase three engagement questions. The final English version would be ready uh, around July 15th, and then it would probably be the week of July 22nd, and we would have translated versions of those questions ready for you all to use. Um, I will flag with that those phase three questions. I'm particularly interested in suggestions on question one. Um, if any of you have suggestions to make it you know, more meaningful reflection, um, it's about the greenhouse gas inventory, which you'll, you'll hear more about later today. Um, I'd be uh, interested um, on that question. I feel like it I feel like it could be a stronger question than it is right now. So any feedback um, is welcome, but I, I highlight that um, uh, in your review. Um, a few other things in your meeting materials. Um, we did also just share two new resources that are available if they're helpful to you, but otherwise don't, um, uh, no need to do anything with them if they're not helpful to you. Um, but we do have a formated, formatted version of a frequently asked questions document about the climate project. Uh, so we included a copy of that in your meeting materials. So feel free to use it if it's helpful at, you know, with your engagement. If it's not, it works, like don't use it. Um, we also now have a one-page summary of climate projections for Clark County with examples of impact as well. So if that is a useful research a resource in your engagement work, please feel free to use it. Um, I have those documents in some, a, a couple of languages already, with, we're waiting on the rest to come through. So if you need um, any of those in a particular language, please let me know and I can uh, let you know what's available. Um, I can also, I will get those in the all the different uh, languages that we do have. I need to get those posted onto your templates uh, 
form the template page so that you can access them easily. So I, I will do that after this meeting. Um, okay. Other things I wanted to give you an update on, um, the community advisory group, so one of our other advisory groups, uh, they met last week and um, they agreed on a, uh, came to agreement on a draft list of resilience policies to move forward for further analysis. And um, uh, so the project team, we uh, need to get a little bit organized. They will be coming back to this group for further review. Um, we are also going to be sharing this draft list with internal county staff for additional review. Um, and then the CAPA strategies team will be doing some additional technical analysis on those policy ideas. So we are going to be shifting gears a little bit today and actually talking about greenhouse gas reduction. Um, but we will be sitting in over the next few months time to look at these draft resilience policies um, so that you all can reflect on them and provide feedback on them, uh, both based on the engagement work you're doing with the uh, communities you're engaging with, as well as with the equity lens. So um, I just wanted to flag that um, in that um, these are going to come back to you to look at more closely, um, but uh, not today. So um, just wanted to note that. Um, okay. I think that was everything that I wanted to no, but glad to take questions if there are any on anything that I did. Good. Thanks, Jenna. So let's pause. Any questions for Jenna on the project updates? Uh, not seeing any. Um, Yolanda, can I welcome you? Say hello. Yeah, mute though if you're saying anything to us. All right, we'll try again, Yolanda. Probably see you there. Um, labeled as NAACP Vancouver. Okay, so no, no questions for Jenna? Okay, let's uh, move to the section of our agenda where we create some space for EJC members uh, to share any announcements, events, uh, opportunities, et cetera, um, that feel uh, relevant to share with your colleagues. Any announcements from EJC members? Monica? I just wanted to um, update uh, everyone on um, the next um, event uh, that I have uh, going um, on July 20th. Um, it's a Saturday um, and it's uh, from. Okay. Oh. This button's uh, can't pop it up. I don't know where it is, but I'll just keep on talking. Um, um, and so it's at the Fourth Plain Forward Commons from 11 a.m. until uh, 3 p.m. Um, and um, we're gonna be discussing um, about the uh, false belief in the hierarchy of human value and really just have a conversation um, uh, as human beings um, so we can break down those thoughts that we are less than in any way, shape, or form. Um, and then the next is gonna be the introduction to donor economics where every human being can thrive within the means of our planetary boundaries. And then after that, it's going to be the create through art um, part, or um, you can do the option of the um, survey. Um, there will be free food throughout the whole event. So when you come in, you, there's going to be food available. So um, you don't need to eat anything for breakfast. Um, and then there's going to be music and um, dancing. Um, and so I hope you all uh, can make it and share with your friends. Um, it will be translated in Spanish and Chukis. Um, and if you um, have any more questions, um, just um, write me an email, and I am um, I'm more than uh, happy to, to talk. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Monica. Other EJC announcements? Uh, yes, but I believe Jenna sent it out. Uh, we're doing a listening session for like women's health uh, questions about like. What are they looking for for improved health um, outcomes? Uh, what are some improved experiences? And I believe Abby's talked about this uh, quite a bit with um, some of the county health people in other formats. But um, I did see that Jenna had sent out uh, the there was a there is a flyer. So I'm not going to um, take up more time to talk about stuff that you can look at. But if you have any people that might be interested in giving their opinion, especially women, or especially looking for women of color. Uh, to give their opinion about what could improve just their their health experiences with um, with healthcare service providers, that would be great. 
Um, and unfortunately, at this time, we do not have like translation type services. This is a pilot and we hope to that we'll be able to get some initial um, information first and then be able to grow or uh, maybe reach out to some of you that do have some of the language abilities that we need to see if we can enlist your help on like one on one interviews and things like that. Awesome. Thank you, Lavina. Other announcements for EJC? Okay. Jude? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know whether this fits in this agenda item or the next agenda item. However, the um, Farm and Food Justice Network did participate in the public comment period for the environmental impact statement scoping process. And you can uh, you can beg forgiveness for having submitted a lot of EJC documentation because I wanted to make sure those issues were on the table. And we did outreach to our network list to let them know this was happening and give them the opportunity to make public comment. And a few actually did from that from that list. So that was good. And in some of the conversations that we've had, I've been really interested in what each of the coalition members, organizations has to say about food and farming and food growing and production. And so one of um, one idea that we're floating around and I would like your feedback on it at some point, in some way, whatever's appropriate, around having a, a meeting of the EJC around food. And as a, as a basic need, how you address this in your communities, what the nexus white might be, and how can we create a little bit more deliberate support network as, as a coalition with this opportunity that, oh my gosh, we're all in the same room, right? Dealing with, with county policy. So there's update, question, reflection, something. <laughs> Thank Thanks you for your attention. I, I thank you, Jude. I, I appreciate your follow up after um, raising that opportunity at the last meeting and sharing um, so much of that with with your colleagues here, Gabriella, and then Anna. Uh, yes, thank you. I want to share that uh, now that we have all the translations. Thank you so much for doing that and with the all the materials that we have. Uh, we'll be reaching out to our community in the food distribution. We have the Mercado Fresco at River City Church where we um, distribute food to all our communities. So we'll have that um, work going on on Saturday 6th. If um, you have family members in your community that can and grab food, free food to go, um, you can share that it's okay to fill out the questionnaire because we'll be doing that um, on the 6th. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriela. Anna? Yes, um, I wanted to let um, all of you know that this year, Latino Leadership Northwest, um, the theme of our conference is gonna be all about environmental justice work. Um, and so this is an invitation to organizations that want a table or that want to um, do, uh, do a workshop for our youth. Um, this is the opportunity to do so. We're going to be hosting it at WSU Vancouver October 4th, uh, if I got the, the, the date correct. Um, and yeah, so this is just an invitation for, for all of you. And we're so excited to, uh, to really focus on uh, our uh, conference on environmental justice work. Awesome. Thank you, Anna. Any other EJC announcements? Okay, well, thank you um, all again. We'll, we're gonna create that space at every one of our meetings. So um, appreciate you all utilizing it in the way that you are. Let's move to reflections on engagement. So 
We had a number of folks uh, share at our last conversation. So I'm going to ask that if you shared last time, just hold back um, and come in, uh, you know, after folks who, who weren't able to share since our, our our last meeting. But I would love to hear, folks, how's it going? Um, so really just reflect, updates. Uh, what are you hearing? What are you seeing? What are you feeling as it relates to the engagement work? Um, I know folks, Ben, Yolanda, folks from PIC, Odyssey, Fourth Plane Forward. There's a number of folks that I don't think we've heard from that have done subsequent work since our last time. Um, so I want to start with those uh, members, and then we'll open it up more broadly to the group. So I can call on you. You can just jump in. I can. Uh, I can go first, guys. So we got yeah. we got our our uh, surveys rolling out to our uh, immigrant and refugee populations, and um, I have our case managers uh, facilitating all of that work. Um, so all of the feedback that I have to provide is is what I've heard from them. Um, there's kind of a mixed bag of of what to report. So certainly we're getting you know data from them in the form of those survey responses. Um, but we're also getting a lot of, you know, <laughs> questions around. We've had some of these folks who have been here for a month or two. We've had some folks who have been here for a year or two. And so that kind of misses a lot of the historical contextual requirements of, of answering some of these questions in full. Um, so it's been really kind of um, interesting to hear our case managers share the conversations that they have with our clients all around uh, the purpose and the meaning and the use of of all this information and data. And um, I think that we're getting good stuff out of it, but I think it's just prompting conversations that haven't really come to mind for uh, a lot of those that we're serving. Awesome. Thank you, Josh. Tavi? I, um, I kind of want to piggyback back off of that too as well. We're having kind of the same um, experience here at Urban Teen. So we're distributing most of our surveys to youth. So um, 13 to 17 year olds. And I'd say that the surveys, if we just hand it to them, um, usually we have to kind of guide them through the surveys. Um, some of the questions are a little bit difficult for them to answer, um, either if that's like the complexity or like, um, I guess the questions and how they're laid out. But um, usually we'll get the teenagers asking us how to answer the questions. So we find that doing the interviews, the one-on-one -on -one interviews are a lot easier um because we're actually with them and talking to them but if we give them like an online survey an emailed survey they usually uh take a while to kind of respond to us asking questions like what does this question mean and stuff like that or usually we'll have an adult have to sit by them and help them answer the questions um but yeah that's kind of something that we were experiencing but also thank you so much for doing the online survey monkey <laughs> survey um it's gonna be so much easier uh for phase two so we really appreciate that Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Ditto. Thank you for that. Huge thank you from Partners and Careers. Yeah, appreciate the gratitude there. Uh, Almanja? Yeah, we, um, we partnered up with Odyssey World again to do tabling at the Juneteenth event. And it was a really beautiful event. Um, I don't have a count of how many surveys we collected yet, but um, one thing that we noticed that did help with our engagement, because at first, at the beginning, because um, we have a team of in survey interviewers, and at first, we were just kind of like getting a sense of like, you know, if people want to come up and speak to us, but um, after an hour or so we really had to like go out and some of us went to like into the farmer's market area and she like she took her clipboard with her and started just like people knew she was up to something and so she had like uh, one of them had conversations with a couple of people um so it's been really um interesting for us as we're you know gathering paper surveys but also engaging in conversations out in public and um yeah so that was one thing that was pretty helpful was when we just like actually spread out and started like having conversations with folks around the survey and not a lot of them took took the survey right away but they um, did save it and said okay you know after you know having a conversation around it said that they would um, complete the survey so I'm hoping they actually did that's great thank you man yeah I can go next so for the Vietnamese community, uh, especially uh, some of the senior, even the the the, the question in the uh, in Vietnamese, but um, I just see that they uh, sometimes get confused by the question, or or probably this is 
the very first time they see something like this, uh, that we get them engaged. And, um, and so I feel like we uh, we need to do a little more one-to-one, -one, help them out, uh, to do a little more hand-on uh, type to get a little more, um, you know, answer from them. Uh, for the younger folk, um, they want some electronic version that they can actually do, uh, few out. Um, so, so that's why I depend on on which case, and I will give them the, the right format. Um, and I think it's going forward. I think we're gonna have a couple of events coming up, um, and then I will actually have you know few of the members gonna go try to get the um, you know one on one try to get the the question they answer so. Thank you, man. Any other updates on engagement? And I, I guess um, if there's folks that have either updates since last time or if there's things that you're learning that you want to share with the group, um, that might be of interest. But uh, let's create a little more space if folks want to share anything else out. Otherwise, Jenna, I'll ask you maybe share just kind of maybe what you're seeing. Amy, I know you've had a chance to kind of look at what folks have been submitted, um, submitting and, and putting forward. So I want to create a little bit um, more space just for any updates that folks are having. And thank you, Yolanda. We got you. Welcome. Thanks so much, Ben. It's a blessing being here. So... Lauren and and uh, Nicole, thanks so much for resending the link. Yeah, appreciate it. Glad you're, you made it in with us. Yes. Okay, any other updates or any reflections on what you're hearing, seeing, learning, feeling as you've done engagement? Jude? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, reflect on, uh, I attended the CAG meeting last week. And those of you who are doing both, it's like, oh my God, <laughs> amazing, because it's it may well, you have to listen, you have to be there to to understand. Uh, but it's very difficult because as a public, <laughs> there's there's not really, you know, any opportunity to intersect with it. So I've been referred back to here, which is why I'm a little more vocal because this is the opportunity where um, everyone's voice is encouraged. And I really appreciate um, your facilitation around ensuring that we maybe go around the room and make sure everyone gets some kind of, some kind of voice in the mix to reflect on what's going on and, and the challenges. I, I really want to also appreciate folks' challenges with who's your audience and who you're trying to reach with what kind of really complicated information that um, may not be the top thing on their list. Yeah. Thanks, Jude. I appreciate you naming that. I think it's come up now a number of times just in the, the challenge of kind of making this relevant and connected to kind of what people are, are experiencing on a day to day. That's, thank you for naming it. Yes. And, it's just yeah. important to not, you know, we talked early on about how that risk of being marginalized already and having this be sort of down the tier in terms of the hierarchy of how this these decisions get made. So just like, I just want to honor that at least we have here. Yeah, I appreciate that, Jude. And then Jenna, I wonder, or Jenna and team, uh, kind of building off, you know, you all are spending some time as, you know, we're getting kind of direct updates from folks and their own reflection, uh, kind of what the, the work that, that folks have been doing out in community with community. And of course, you all are are getting the the summaries of, of findings. So I'd love to just see if you all have any reflection updates or, or anything that you want to uh, kind of bring into the room. Yeah, um, I can start and then if Amy and Lauren, if there's anything you want to add from things you, you've noticed. But um, I wanted to share a little bit about the process we've been using as you all are sending us what you're hearing, your notes and your survey data and stuff to us. So um, in your meeting materials, we included a, a very rough first draft 
um, for calling it a report on the phase one engagement um, activities. And um, I, first, I just want to acknowledge this only includes feedback we had with progress reports as of June 16th. So it actually only includes a handful of your activities. A, a lot more has come in in the past couple of weeks. Um, so this is very far from being complete. But um, it was sort of our first attempt to figure out how to package all of this amazing work um, that's happening for, for this project. So, um, so basically our process has been based on reviewing um, any survey data you're collecting, your progress reports where you're highlighting things that stood out to you. Um, we're reviewing the notes from these meetings where you've been reflecting on what stood out to you. Um, we um, are trying to draft a fairly short summary report where a key section in it is key takeaways, where we're trying to highlight these are the main things that are standing out to us um, from the, the feedback and data that we're collecting. Um, we also then are creating an appendix where we're putting a lot of the details. So, I mean, it's kind of amazing with county engagement plus 15 of your organizations doing outreach, um, you all have, we are producing so much data. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty incredible. I think the appendix were in the hundreds of pages already. Um, so anyway, but, but I'm trying to package it, you know, try to be fairly consistent, take what you all give us, you know, format it fairly consistently from project to project. So we'll copy, if you did a focus group, you know, we're, we're copying your notes over. If you did survey data, um, we've got for each question, the results um, from that data. Um, so uh, we're gonna keep building that as you all send things to us. And then um, my process is as I, once I format it, I look at it and then I look at the key takeaways and I'm trying to check, okay, is what's standing out in this data already captured in this key takeaway list or do we need to add something? Um, so for instance, um, I think I was looking at some of the Council for the Homeless data recently and there was some very specific feedback, you know, very specific to our population without housing, right, that I, I added a couple of things into the key takeaways because it didn't seem like it was being captured in what was already already there, for instance. So, um, so I thought that was interesting that it did, so far, you know, as I reviewed uh, specific engagement opportunities, it was um, making me revise and add to that, that key takeaway summary. Um, so my plan is to keep doing that. Um, I know uh, there's a whole another wave of uh, things heading our way. Um, we won't finalize this report until um, you all are done with your phase one um, engagement work. We'll just keep updating it um, until we're done. Um, as a group, um, and let's see, I guess my ask of all of you is, um, you know, if you look at the, the key takeaways in the report that um, you double check us, like, like let us know if you think something major is missing, right? Like it's a, sum, you know, summary, it's not gonna have all the little details, but if there's a, something that's standing out to you that is not being captured in there, please let us know so that we can updated. Um, let's see. So, okay, so our plan is to, um, we'll make one of these past, like, reports for each phase of the engagement. So we've got four phases planned. So anything that happens related to uh, one phase of engagement, um, we'll package into a report. So by the end of the year, we'll have four of these that is summarizing every, um, all of the feedback that we have um, heard through your work um, and the county's engagement work. Um, and then the point of doing all that, besides packaging it and saying, here it is, is that, um, I mean, we want to work with all of you as we look at draft policy lists to think about, okay, well, what stood out from our engagement? And now let's look at the policy list. Are there gaps? Are there things we need to change? So we want to use it as a tool um, to help inform a review and feedback of those draft policy ideas. Um, so we'll be doing that with the resilience policies, and then later on we'll do that also with the greenhouse gas policies. Um, and then also, you know, I, I think it's going to be useful with the equity lens too, because, you know, when we get to questions around what data did we use, this is the data, you know, a, a lot of it is the community-based data. So um, it'll be a resource to us um, moving forward. Um, I do need to make those reports a little bit more user-friendly so that you can like click on your event and go right to your data. Right now, nothing's linked. So 
um, we'll keep working on that, but just wanted to share that that was our first attempt. Glad to uh, take any feedback from um, any of you on that and also glad to answer any questions. Okay, thanks, Jenna. So questions for Jenna? Laura? Yeah, yeah. I just want to say thanks, Jenna. That's amazing. <laughs> just, I just blown away. That's great. Thank yeah. you, Jude. I just wanted to confirm that my understanding is this, this is a compilation of both CAG and EJC and public. Um, it's all the um, engaged, the, all the feedback coming through public engagement that's not actually advisory group feedback. So it meant so so it's including like so the county like we've put out this first survey you know so as a you know we got from any interested member of the public so it is a combination of any member of the public and then you're all focused engagement work if that makes sense so it's intended as like non advisory group public engagement um, oh. is that, I don't know if that's clear or not huge but um, uh, that's the the hope is that we've got our advisory group, you know, there's only so many people who can be part of an advisory group. So now this is up. So what does everyone else think? Right? Um, and so that's what this is trying to capture. Okay. So as an advisory group, EJC, our our job might be to add to this or our constituents add to this, or how do we or do we directly make public comment as a member or like what's um, yeah, no, good question. So my expectation is so like farm and food, right? You all are doing some engagement that you've all planned, right? And so as you, um, whether it's, I can't remember exactly what you all are doing, but whether it's the surveys or conversations you have, you all will, um, you'll be relaying those notes, right? Or survey results back to the county. And so that is what we will then fold into this document. So we're really trying to compile what is the community saying. Um, and so we'll be able to, um, you know, for a specific um, event that you all do, we'll have it in the appendix so we could, you could just look at that. But then our summary themes would be a compilation of Gerald's work plus all the other EJC engagement feedback um, plus the county's just general broad community engagement. That. So this is the, I think as an EJC member, your job is to, um, you all are not only helping collect feedback, right, but I think your job is to then help elevate what it is that you're hearing, right? So if something is standing out to you as you're talking to farmers, for instance, um, and that is not showing up in the summary, you should say, hey, I'm hearing this, but I don't see it in this document. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. It, 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 okay. because, because, you know, in contrast to the CAG, which actually makes decisions, I mean, they have a, like agreements on what was got moved forward for analysis, and they seem to, you know, kind of vote. But we're not really as a as a coalition. We're not really. Are we making decisions as well as a group? Um, you all will, your, your primary task is to help us with engagement. However, the, the secondary part of that is then to use that engagement to provide feedback to those draft policy lists. So, right, CAG had to come up with something, but you all are then going to get to weigh in and say, you know, I'm hearing this and I don't see this in the draft policy list, or this seems in conflict with this. So, we um, would like you all to use there's a little bit of a delay because to do engagement takes time, right, with, with other people. But our hope is that you can use what you're hearing um, to help inform the feedback that will then go back to the CAG. Um, and we'll say, hey, here's what the EJC is recommending. So our, our hope as a group is you all will be um, collectively providing feedback um, back to the county and CAG um, based on your engagement work. Okay, thank you. Yeah, very helpful. Thank you. Great questions. 
Any other questions for Jenna or final reflections? And that was, that was a good point, just maybe closing this conversation just around the importance of the work that you all are doing to bring in input and information from community to inform the broader process. Monica, jump in. Yes, um, I, I was wondering, because I was reading, you know, like, when's a good time to, to say this, but this is something that I got from a, uh, a person that I admire and and and, um, and is from the community, um, but this is what um, she said, and she would like to remain anonymous. Uh, today I was introduced to Eden City. The episode on food and feeding, feeding it is mind-boggling and beautiful. Vision of a future, the elements of which could all be informative of a comp plan up update. If those designing the update could actually think outside the dominant culture boxes, the mindsets that constrain genuine creativity. Clark County, as represented in the CAG, is still sort of kind of stuck in the thinking of future being about growth. Land for jobs equals jobs. For money equals buying your well-being. Based on an extraction and consumption economy, or sometimes called predatory capitalism or colonization or empire building, what is the design imperative with sustainable well-being of human communities? The technology fix we need as about relationships and community and mutual care, not gadgets, about belonging and reciprocity. The, the known how and the know-how and wisdom is ancient and mostly forgotten in modern Western cultures. It feels to me that we are not yet having the right conversation. I am pretty clueless on how to shift the conversation in a direction that would be more meaningful and useful to seven generations ahead. Um, and there's a, um, uh, Eden Nissany, there's a podcast uh, that uh, is talking more about uh, a more thriving and, 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 um, and gardening based community um, and food, local food designing. But when, when designing the update, we need to actually think outside development and culture. And people say that this is just too far out there or things will never change. But one of the things that change people's minds is they actually see what they believe to be impo impossible, actually possible. So everything is about relationship, relationship and reciprocity. Everything is connected. And people ask, well, what the, it's going to cost more. Um, and it's like cost more uh, uh, than what? Our health? Our, our mental health, our, 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 our physical health, and the ecosystem is a vulnerable community. We need the rights of nature codified into law. We need to frame our questions with dignity, dignity and desire. Dignity and desire are about responsiveness. So those were the thoughts that I wanted to share with you all from the community. All right, thank you, Monica. I appreciate you, you uplifting that, that framing, those voices um, in the way that you do. Thank you. Amy? Thanks, Ben. I just thought I would reiterate a couple things. Jenna, Jenna has said some of this already, but just um, again, thanking you all for the work that you're doing and hope you're seeing just how important it is for all of the feedback that you are collecting because we will continue to compile this information. And for just a little overview for yourselves and anyone who may listen to this, the month of May, there were 28 different engagement activities that you all put out there. and 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 got out into your own communities and, and in the Clark County community. So, um, and then in June, we have another 16 events that took place. In July, we have an additional 22 events. And this kind of continues clear through the fall. It does start to fall, you know, windle down a little bit in numbers, but um, what Jenna has described, this report that uh, was just, um, in your packet and, and this first kind of draft cut of what we're hearing from all of you is that phase one of activities that just happened in this very beginning part of the project. So there's much more to come and we're, we are really appreciative. We wouldn't be able to get this kind of feedback without all of the work and commitment that you all are doing. So thank you. Thanks for naming it, um, Amy, appreciate that. To the last call for any other updates or reflections, questions, comments for Amy, Jenna, and team. Okay. Well, we are a bit ahead of time, um, but I, I know we have our colleagues here for, in, in our next se session. Um, do folks want to take a break now or you want to keep 
moving through and we can find a pause point in about 30 minutes. I vote break. Okay, we got Levita voting break. I'm not seeing any opposition. Gabriella? I'm down break. for break too. All right. Let's, break all right, let's take a break. Let's come, let's take 10 minutes. We'll come back at 440. Does that work? Okay, see you in 10. Thanks.
All right, well, welcome back for 40. So folks, uh, do a little thumbs up or something to let me know you're back. Or pop on the screen. There you go. Thank you. Or hand up. I guess we don't have thumbs. Maybe there's no thumbs. But hands up. Thank you. All right. I see see hands being raised. Thank you. So, Tracy, I think I'm going to pass it to you. We're going to move into our um, introduction to the greenhouse gas sub-element. Um, and we have plenty of time for conversation. So, Tracy, take it away. Thanks, Ben. Um, next slide, please. Thanks. So, um, we are going to, as Jenna mentioned, um, shift gears a little bit um, this month, starting this month, we'll come back to um, uh, resilience and you will you will get more information about resilience in the coming month. Uh, but we're taking a little bit of a uh, break right now to introduce um, greenhouse gas sub element to you. Um, so a little bit about what we plan to do today with the greenhouse gas sub element on the next slide. Um, we will be talking to you about the greenhouse gas inventory that our team completed for um, for unincorporated Clark, uh, Clark County and um, tell you a little bit about what, what a greenhouse gas inventory is, make sure that we're all getting that same foundation on the same page um, regarding greenhouse gas inventorying, uh, then give you those, those results for Clark County. Um, and then we're going to start talking about what emissions reduction planning looks like, um, just to give you a, a bit of a preview of what should be coming over the next couple months, and then a brief overview of the schedule, and then we can we can do questions. Um, and we do have questions inserted throughout, um, because as you're being introduced to more um, technical information that you may have uh, varying um, degrees of of um, previous exposure to, we want to make sure that you get access to asking those questions um, early on. So we'll pause um, a couple times to to get clarifying questions and make sure that everyone is on the same page as we're moving forward. So with that, um, um, I want to uh, just turn it over to our lead greenhouse gas analyst, um, Claudia, who's here with us today, and she's going to talk about greenhouse gases and then share inventory results with you. Thank you, Tracy. Perfect. All right. So GHG Inventory 101 is where we will get started. So I'm going to first introduce what a GHG inventory is, and then we'll get um, moving on actually looking at the results. So next slide, please. Thank you. So first of all, what is a GHG inventory? And I know it's really technical, uh, technical and there's a lot of text here on the slide, but it is basically just an accounting of the different greenhouse gases that are released or removed from the atmosphere during a specific period of time, whether it's for an organization or community, doesn't matter. There's many different ways of doing this, but they all kind of follow this accounting of in and out. Um, and GHGs are in large part, as we know, from the burning of fossil fuels, right? Burning of gasoline, burning of oil, um, burning of natural gas. Um, but there are other sources of GHG emissions, and that includes refrigerants, wastewater treatment, landfilled waste, land use change. We're going to talk a little bit more about what those mean. Um, and then they provide, what they do for a community in particular is provide an emissions baseline and a way to track your emissions reductions over time and your progress towards your goals. Um, you'll see here on this table on the right, uh, listed are, are the three main greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. And since they're all different gases, we have to find a common way of measuring them. So you might've seen this before, but we call it a metric ton of carbon dioxide equivalent, CO2E. Um, and each, each greenhouse gas has a different global warming potential. So you'll see there methane, also known as CH4, has a global warming potential of 28. Uh, this means that methane is 28 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So you can imagine um, just as the, as the gases get more and more potent, it, it matters kind of a lot uh, exactly how much we're releasing, releasing into the atmosphere. Um, so global warming potentials vary a lot. The highest one uh, 
specific refrigerant can have high DWP gases up to 24 times as strong as the greenhouse gas and carbon dioxide. Next slide, please. And so what is one metric ton CO2E? It kind of helps to have something to kind of ground it to, to compare it to. One metric ton CO2E is equivalent to a passenger vehicle car driven uh, 2,500 miles. Um, so your typical person driving 10,000 miles a year in the U.S., uh, that's four metric tons CO2E, also the same as 13% of one U.S. home's average energy use for a year, or 46 propane cylinders for home barbecues, or the amount of forest sequestration, so that additional breathing in of carbon dioxide by trees, uh, 1.2 acres of forest sequestration for one year. And on the right there, you have a nice visual of what one metric ton of carbon dioxide looks like. It's about the size of a house. You can imagine this being released throughout the year on your behalf, kind of stacked against the earth. That's what it visually will look like. Next slide, please. And kind of the last piece of this GHG inventory 101 uh, are scopes. Um, so we have looked at Scopes one, two, and three, those are the three different types uh, in a GHG inventory. Scope one is just everything that's happening in your geographic boundary. So um, all of the uh, fossil fuel combustion, all of the different uh, emissions directly from this geographic area from Clark County, uh, whether it's land use or uh, waste and wastewater treatment. Scope two is all energy that is produced on your behalf. This is really just electricity. Um, sometimes there's other energy as well, but electricity that is purchased and used inside the community. And then scope three is everything else that is due to demand from the community from, from inside that geographic boundary, but that occurs elsewhere. Um, so uh, we're this this approach that we're doing, it follows the State Department of Commerce, but making sure that we're not just following the bare minimum. We've taken it a little bit further and made uh, a more comprehensive view and included a few extra things that really do matter. Um, and for context, it's the calendar year 2022. This is only for the, the results you're going to see here are only for the unincorporated areas of the county. So not including any of the cities. Uh, and we have split these county results into urban versus rural. All right, um, I realize I can't see anyone's faces. Uh, let me know if you have any urgent questions as we start to get into the next piece. But as uh, Tracy pointed out, we have a Q&A section at the end of my presentation and then additional Q&A at the end of hers as well. So there will be opportunities for questions, but um, I suppose uh, a hand raised or something like that would alert me to uh, to pause and, and answer any questions. Next slide, please. All right, so we're gonna dig into Clark County's 2022 uh, results for the GHG inventory. Next slide, please. All right, we're gonna stay here for a moment. These are kind of the first uh, most important um, sources of, of GHG emissions for, for the community. So these are your local emissions. We have building energy there. You can see it's gonna be biggest to smallest here. So building energy, any electricity, any natural gas, any energy for building use. Uh, we also have transportation emissions, fairly straightforward, anything that's moving, uh, transporting uh, people or goods. Agriculture, forestry, and land use, any sort of emissions that happen from um, from farming, from cutting down trees, whether it's from forestry or building new homes, anything like that, but also taking into account the additional growth uh, from, from plants and trees. And if the forest is growing, that's also included here. Industrial process and product use. Um, for Clark County, this is largely from refrigerant gases, again, really potent gases, but Sounds very complicated. It's really anything that helps refrigerate air, whether it's refrigerators, air conditioning, um, can be in your vehicles as well as your buildings, um, anything like that. And then solid waste and wastewater is just how we process an emissions from, from waste, whether it's in the county or 
uh, taken elsewhere to a landfill outside of the community. So these local emissions total nearly one and a half million metric tons CO2e. That's a big number. It's hard to know kind of what that means, but it's 6.1 metric tons CO2e per person, so per capita. So building energy, transportation, and uh, I'm going to call it AFLU for short. These are the largest emission sources for Clark County. Next slide, please. Beyond these kind of local emission sources are also imported emission sources. It's, again, what we call those emissions that are happening elsewhere, but that are due to demand and um, from the local community. So goods, food, those are the main ones. Um, also air travel from, from residents and fuel production from all the electricity, the gasoline, et cetera, that occur elsewhere. Um, and these are really significant, you can see it, 2.5 million metric tons CO2e, so quite a bit more than the local emission sources. Um, those would be missed if you're only looking at what's happening inside a community rather than what uh, is uh, directly and indirectly happening from the community. And so these emissions are 10.7 metric tons CO2e per person, uh, largely from goods, but also food um, being really the, the top two emission sources here. Next slide, please. And here we get to see it all together um, in relation versus urban. Um, I put population numbers there in the bottom right. You can see the rural population is about 70,000 compared to the urban, about 170,000. Um, so we'll, we would expect the, the urban bars there to be, to be taller. So uh, with a population of about 240,000, uh, emissions are 4 million metric tons CO2e all combined and 16.8 metric tons CO2e per person. So you can kind of tell if you were to use this as a foundation for climate action, what should you be focusing on, right? That's going to be the next pieces that we're going to be talking about. Um, you can see that building energy and transportation are kind of the main things on, on the local emission sources. And then uh, goods, all the stuff, as well as food uh, on the on the imported emission sources. Next slide, please. So we're going to dig in a little bit more closely um, on each of these. They're called sectors. So GHG emissions by sector and first buildings and energy, some details about this. Um, so again, it's 36 percent of local emissions. Um, electricity is the most um, uh, common emission source. It's available throughout the county, um, which is why you'll see that natural gas drop off there from urban versus rural because it's not as available in the rural community. Um, and so there's a need to kind of compensate by more electricity for heating and other things. And then there's a little bit of other emissions, largely things like propane and fuel oil. Um, some other kind of technical things from uh, the infrastructure itself for electricity and natural gas, but electricity and urban use of, of natural gas are kind of the highest sources of emissions in, in your building, uh, building energy emissions. Next slide, please. A little bit more complicated to look at here, we have transportation emissions. Um, we have the urban pie breakdown on the left there and the rural on the right. Um, just easier to view for transportation emissions, but for both, they're, they're fairly similar. You'll see gasoline emissions being uh, the most significant regardless um, from all the passenger cars. We're assuming it's gasoline uh, unless it's a known electric vehicle. Uh, and then you'll see diesel emissions from freight, tiny bit of transit off-road diesel from construction, from perhaps logging, anything that's not on an actual road, but is still a diesel use. Um, and then a little bit of rail, uh, known electric vehicles, and then a lot of purchased air travel. And the reason it's different um, is because it's a lot based on uh, population uh, in total, uh, but also kind of the socioeconomic breakdown of that. The more income a household has, the more likely they are to purchase additional 
air travel throughout the year. So this is kind of blending that green is your local emissions and that magenta bright kind of pink purple hue is an imported emission source, but that is still very uh, relevant to transportation. Next slide, please. All right, so agriculture, forestry, and land use, 21% of local emissions. I want to first focus on the left side here. So this is your uh, emissions um, for one year. You can see the net carbon, uh, forest carbon law. Excuse me, saw a message there pop up. Um, so net forest carbon law uh, is the biggest source. So this is trees that are cut down or otherwise no longer there. Um, there is more uh, loss of forest than there is new forest growing uh, in Clark County. So there's some emissions associated with your uh, forest and land use change. Um, also some emissions from livestock. This is a lot of um, cows uh, are, are kind of the, the main source. It's, it's predominantly a lot of beef and dairy uh, cattle and cows, um, but uh, other animals um, from farming as well. And then some soil amendments from known kind of uh, fertilizer use and things like that. Um, and then you see there on the right, this is a graph that has much bigger numbers. So we look at uh, forest emissions or tr really trees um, as a net. So we know that there is a lot of emissions associated with cutting down trees, but also really significant. We know that trees are really powerful. Um, it's called sequestration. They uh, draw in carbon dioxide that how, what they breathe in. Uh, and so they sequester and take out uh, a lot of carbon dioxide from the air. Um, and if you add that together, the emissions positive and sequestration of the negative, you get that net number. And that's what you see visible on the pie on the left. So about 227,000 metric consideration. Next slide, please. All right, so industrial process and product use known as IPPU. Um, industrial process emissions are, are non-energy sources of emissions. So this is um, only things that are not used for energy. There's no um, specific industrial process emissions in the county. Uh, they're all in incorporated areas inside some of the cities. Um, but there is what's called refrigerant use, known as product use. Um, and again, that air conditioning systems, refrigerators, walk-in coolers, um, anything like that um, is included in refrigerants. Um, and again, these can be really potent greenhouse gases. Some of your most common ones are like one to two times, one to 2000, excuse me, uh, times as strong as carbon dioxide, but not generally the that 23,500. Um, but there are still a 5% is uh, still somewhat significant. And we know that this is generally kind of going up each year. There's there's some uh, things happening on the federal level to reduce these, but for now they've been uh, kind of going up each year. Next slide, please. All right, last but not least on the local emission sources, waste and wastewater, so 2%. Um, again, we are looking at urban versus rural because there's some differences here, um, but solid waste is everything that is taken to uh, a landfill. Central wastewater, of course, if you're on a central wastewater treatment plant um, in um, either a city or in some of the more urban areas, there's some emissions associated with that, some methane and nitrous oxide. Uh, and then septic systems, both in the urban and rural areas, also create those same uh, methane and nitrous oxide sources. Um, so combined, these are, are fairly small, um, still significant, but only about 2% of your local emissions um, when uh, before including imported emission sources. Next slide, please. And last but not least, imported emissions. Um, this is gonna, there's a lot of detail on here, so I'll do my best to kind of describe it without going into too much detail, but you'll see an urban versus rural split here. This is the consumption of goods and services and fuel and air travel. Um, 
I think the main thing to note is uh, the really bigger blocks, right? We have clothing, furniture, and construction in goods. We have meat and dairy in food. And we have upstream fuel production um, from uh, vehicle fuels. That's for gasoline and diesel largely, um, as well as air travel. Um, and so all together, these, these are small little pieces that kind of add up and become a really big emission source. You, could, you saw that in the beginning, that this is much more significant for Clark County than, than your local emission sources. Um, so they need to be addressed as well, even though they're not happening locally, um, they are due to uh, the demand of, of residents and businesses in the Clark County area. I think that's the last slide before the Q&A. Yeah, perfect. I can't see anyone's faces during the, the spotlight um, for my presentation piece. I don't know if that's uh, possible to take off, but um, I'd be happy to answer any questions about the GHG inventory or the inventory 101, kind of what everything means. I know we're ahead of schedule, so we, we've got a good amount of time if people have questions. Yeah, thanks, Claudia. I think you could probably click on your view and go to gallery, and that should hopefully let you see everybody. Everybody was making very, oh, thank you. very nice faces. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I think we have. <laughs> That's great. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think, um, was it Yolanda, then Jude? Hi there, Ben. And thank you so much, Claudia. What an informative presentation. Oh, my gosh. So that last slide, if you can click it back, I think it was 31. So yeah. as yeah, as we look at this here, um, you said this was pertinent or specific to Clark County, right? Yes, it is important to know that these are much more estimated than the other sources. But yes, this is specifically estimated for Clark County. Okay. I and it's and I do see the Clark County Washington logo on the lower left hand corner. I just wanted to be clear that this was specific to Clark County. And what this bubbles up to the top of my mind, I'm not sure if others would agree, but everything that we think is uh, so called, quote unquote, not good for us, <laughs> you know, people who like an abundance of things like clothing or furniture, um, and we keep building construction, we're not doing green building. But then if we look at our diet too, dairy and meat, um, these are the things that are causing um, emissions or trouble within our immediate um, environment. I think that's, that's noteworthy um, to be said here. And my last question is, um, will these slides are, and you may have said this earlier, but I was having some connectivity issues. Are these slides available to us? I think I'm gonna pass that to Jenna. I would like to think so. Yeah, typically we would post, right, Jenna? Yeah, we'll, we'll get these up um, probably tomorrow. Um, so when Nicole sends her follow-up email, that will let you know they have been posted. Okay, awesome. This is great information that I'd like to share with our in AACP audiences, I think it's important for them to see um, this um, in, in, in the fuse that you've done, Claudia. Very informative. Thank you so much. My yeah. pleasure. And it definitely a large team effort here. I'm the one presenting today, but uh, a lot of folks involved. Oh, well, thank you to everyone. Please do not <laughs> let me leave out anyone. There we go. We'll, we'll spread the love on uh, Claudia gets to, to get all the praise, but yes, we'll spread the love. Uh, Jude, jump in, please. Yeah, so I just wanted to clarify, I think you did, that this is unincorporated Clark County data. Correct. Right? So yes. the 240,000 population, is that unincorporated Clark County? So that we're getting an accurate per capita here? Yes. Uh, it is not including any of the cities. Okay. Correct. So then my other question is, how did you decide what's rural and urban? Because it's not a really straightforward question. In Excellent hospital. question. Uh, we worked with Jenna a lot on this one. Um, it's basically 
the, uh, and I apologize for not mentioning this in the beginning, it is basically the difference between the urban growth areas, right? So not incorporated, but an urban growth area of the cities, so those are urban, and everything that is not inside of an urban growth area is considered rural. So that is the definition of urban versus rural. Great, great. And so will there be an opportunity to do a scenario comparison? For example, this uh, imported food versus a local food economy that might have a lot more refrigeration issues or its, its own transportation challenges, but obviously our imported food is pretty high there. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm going to pass your question. Probably, I'm gonna give that one to Tracy, but first I will say um, with food, I clearly uh, that is, a uh, an area of interest for you, I can tell based on your title there, Farm and Food Justice Coalition. Um, I want to say that local food is very important, um, but no one county should expect, you know, to be an island of perfect, um, being, being fully self-sustaining and I think uh, in particular on the West Coast, we do have, best based on the knowledge I have, we do have kind of better numbers, if you will, than the rest of the country. We're able to grow a lot of stuff. Is that really what I'm trying to say here on, on the West Coast and Clark County included? We can grow a lot of things here. We can um, provide a lot of the things that we need as a community, but we will never be able to do everything um and i think picking and choosing what type of food should be part of the conversation in addition to a local food interest so um again that kind of graphic we just saw where you can see um meat and dairy compared to cereals and produce um what type of food is also important in addition to where it's coming from but I will pass the question of, uh, to Tracy about um, modeling. I I don't want to misspeak on that piece. Uh, Tracy? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for the question, Jude. Um, we do not have it in our scope to provide scenario analysis for um, for um, lots of questions. We do, We will be, once we define the actions that we are interested in studying further, we will look at um, the potential greenhouse gas emissions reductions that that would be possible from those actions. Um, so you might get some of that information in in that part of our study um, that um, uh, that we'll be deciding on uh, in the coming months. Um, but there are also lots of resources out there, and um, I, this is what this is a question that's been um, studied a lot, and so there there's some great resources out there too. Um, if you look at um, uh, food distance and types of food, and as Claudia mentioned, um, uh, as a high level summary of a lot of that, uh, the most important thing is really what it is that we're growing to eat, um, more important than than where it comes from. Well, I think the bigger underlying issue is really is land conversion and the impact. Of mm -hmm. that. But I, 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 I would assume that that will be part of your analysis because it's part of the policies and um, but we have a challenge here in terms of land available for mm. trees or farming mm -hmm. yeah absolutely yes we saw that that net number it's trees up versus trees down and uh trees are very valuable um as carbon sequestrators right to hold our carbon dioxide. And if we cut them down and immediately release all that carbon, it's, it's it takes a really long time to grow a big tree. Um, so they're much more valuable it's left standing in, and uh, in terms also of note, the climate. Sorry to yeah. interrupt. I'll no, also it, note that um, the our answers are specifically related to greenhouse gases. And so, um, yes. as, as we're moving forward, we will also be evaluating other co-benefits. Um, and so, 
remember that this this presentation and this discussion right now is really focused on those greenhouse gases. So um, there are lots of other things to to keep in mind too. Great, right. that that's really helpful. And I know folks have named and at least alluded to, if not named explicitly, some of the co benefits. Um, from from types of land use or from local agriculture, et cetera. So let's go, Monica, then Gabriella. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to share this with the whole group and I wanted to share who, whoever, whoever wants it on this episode um, of Eden City. It's sustainability through massive abundance. Um, episode 11, feeding the world in style. How a human scale food system can feed 10 billion people on 97% less land than we use now with higher quality and social justice than the world has ever known. Um, in this um, episode, it talks about um, uh, the big lie of agriculture, agriculture uh, substance, subsistence farming for billionaires, uh, what's wrong with the market garden, uh, farm to table advantages, block to cafe advantages, tour of Eden City food system, zone one is rooftop gardens, zone two, courtyard orchards, zone three, uh, broad care village crops, Zone four, four spells around town, and zone five is wilderness. Um, so I would love to share that with a broader group. Um, it's a great episode, and it really takes you a deep dive into what really uh, can be planted and everything in, in, in various different types of uh, climates. So, um, yeah, thank you. That's what I wanted to share. Yeah, thank you, Thanks. Monica, and for that resource. Sorry, Claudia. Thank you, you, Monica. Oh, sorry. Gabriella? Uh I was just expecting to get a, a, a question and getting to receive some information was really fun for a change. So thank you, Monica. I appreciate, appreciate that. Um, Gabri Gabriella and then Almandria. Yes, thank you. And I'm sorry I'm not turning on my camera because my computer keeps freezing uh, because of connection with the internet. Um, thank you so much for the information. Um, it's quite interesting seeing the visual of uh, green gas, house, uh, uh, green gas emissions, and um, I do have a question about the um, the trees because we see um, the cut of the trees, uh, how much has increased, and that reduces the oxygen, the clean oxygen that we have for uh, for us to breathe. How my question is. Let me see how I put this. The age of a tree or the height or the foliage that a tree needs to have for how many people? Um, because we hear things like, oh, we're cutting all these uh, trees that are mature for uh, wood supply, construction, etc. right? For construction. But we are planting like millions of trees, which is tiny little trees that have no maturity, nor foliage, or the capacity to give the oxygen that the trees they cut. So that's why the question, like how old or mature a tree needs to be to give that kind of oxygen that they cut down, that like the comparison, and how long it will take, if you know, how long it will take for a tree to get to that point. That, that is a great question, and I have a partial answer for you. It's part of the report, um, so you should be able to receive that once that is finalized. But um, to sort of answer, um, so uh, the local and imported emissions associated with Clark County are 4 million, right? 4 million metric tons CO2E per year. Um, uh, in emissions, um, and that is the equivalent to the carbon sequester by over 4.7 million acres of average U.S. forest. We know the Pacific Northwest, we have really lush, thick, dense forests, and we do a little bit of uh, better carbon sequestration, but average. Uh, and that area is roughly 10% of the size of Washington State. So you can imagine if Washington State was covered in forest in the entirety of it, which is not possible. Um, Clark County alone would need 10% of that just to account for one year's worth, um, uh, that current day's worth of emissions. So um, each year, 10% of Washington state 
uh, would be the equivalent amount of sequestration and emissions. Does that get at what you're wanting to, to know? Yes, yes. Thank you so much. This is shocking. I know what's bad and not that bad. So yeah, thank you so much. For your Absolutely. Time. Yeah, thank you for that, Gabrielle. Alvanja? So love to learn more about trees. It's fascinating. But I was actually wondering, um, Claudia, I'm looking forward to these slides. Um, you said this is just for the year of 2022? Correct. Okay, cool. And do you guys have like data on like how it's been increasing over the years and how mm -hmm. that projection is looking? Like um, so historically, no, not part of the scope. I do believe um, we will be projecting into the future what it's going to look like, but that uh, piece has not been started yet. And I think maybe I'll pass it to Tracy to see if there's anything to add on that. I'll just say that as part of this um, uh, climate ele sub element, this is the first greenhouse gas inventory that um, yeah. Clark County has done. So uh, we don't have historical information. Yeah, well, it's great that you guys are finally doing something like this. It'd just be cool how to see where, you know, we started off from and then kind of have something to measure off from. Um, and then also, uh, this is just me thinking out loud because I just got so excited with all the data you guys are sharing, but um, it looks like maybe we need to um, support more of our like local um, vendors who probably do, you know, like recycle clothing and recycle materials um, so that we're not having to use too much land in Clark County and also have to import so many um, goods. But yeah, anyways, it, that was just something really exciting, like an area of um, solution, you know, keeping our uh, local economy and, um, you know, local talents, maybe um, training construction workers into green, sustainable um, jobs and those kind of things. So thank you so much for these um, slides. I'm really looking forward to it. Our pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Almondra. Jump right in there. I had one more thing to say. Almondra, I love that you're thinking of solutions already. That's great. Uh, and then also, I just wanted to mention that um, as part of the future comprehensive planning, Clark County will be doing a greenhouse gas inventory in the future. I think about every five years is the expectation. Um, so um, and of course, it can be done more frequently, but about every five years. So you will start to see um, actual change over time. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, great questions. Any other questions for Claudia? And we, we do have another kind of part two of the, the presentation. And then, of course, if anything comes up, we'll have another Q&A section as well. But any other questions around the first set of data? Okay. Well, Tracy, why don't you take us into part two, and then uh, we'll do another Q&A section um, after that. Thank you. Yeah, and great um, great questions there. Um, so now we're going to talk about um, what to do about these emissions, because um, our charge is to reduce emissions in Clark County. Um, and so I, and just to step back a second and think about the whole um, uh, climate element project overall. We started with um, resilience, and that's because resilience is the way that talking about resilience um, goals and policies is um, the the way that climate hazards, all of these greenhouse gases in the atmosphere cause the climate hazards. And then that's how you interact with the effects of these greenhouse gases in your daily life. And so um, we started with what is the most familiar to people, how um, how you may be interacting with the effects of um, of greenhouse gas emissions in your in your day to day lives with your families. Um, and so now we're coming back to why these changes exist in the first place. And so um, that is the um, the release of greenhouse gases, the human release of greenhouse gases. Um, and so um, now we're going to talk a little bit about emissions reduction planning. 
what steps we we will be taking over the course of this project to um, uh, to plan for ways that Clark County can um, have impact on reducing these greenhouse gases. Um, so next slide, please. Um, just to make sure that we have a common definition, um, greenhouse gas emissions reduction is taking action to reduce or eliminate the emissions of greenhouse gases in order to reduce the rate and extent of climate change damage. Um, so, um, and then I'll remind you that in the resilience piece, um, we we did some broad brainstorming um, with uh, CAG, we did some more brainstorming here, and then we combined um, we combined all of the information that we got from everybody. We packaged it all together, and we um, created some goals and policies. And then those goals and policies are being reviewed by um, by this group and by CAG, and then um, and then uh, those will you know get will decide which ones get further analysis and 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 move forward. Um, and I just want to um talk a little bit about the em emissions reduction pathway and it's going to be a little bit different um because um there are um uh these emissions these sources of emissions are rel are common for um for everyone right and so um, there are some really tried and true and effective ways to reduce the specific emissions that we're seeing in Clark County. And so what we want to do is um, uh, we'll, uh, our team will identify various options, various opportunities to address the, um, the emissions from the sources that are um, the, um, the strongest in Clark County. And um, and then we will uh, bring that information to the group to start prioritizing. So rather than starting with brainstorming a bunch of ideas, we're going to bring together the most effective um, ways of reducing emissions. And then um, we, we will talk about how Clark, how it makes sense for Clark County to do some of those things. And then um, also <clears throat> it's important to know that um, best science indicates that we need to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels to avoid um, severe climate hazards and reduce the risk associated with long-lasting or irreversible changes, such as the loss of some ecosystems. And we're already starting to see the consequences of one degree of climate uh, global climate warming. Um, we're seeing more extreme weather, rising sea levels, uh, Arctic sea ice, and more locally, we're seeing all of the different climate hazards that we've been talking about, um, flooding and uh, wildfires and smoke and extreme heat, um, extreme weather. So that's that's where we are with about one degree of, of um, global warming through climate change. And um, so the goal is to limit to 1.5 degrees. And in order to get there, um, we uh, scientists have estimated that um, we need to get to net zero emissions by 2050. So that's the that's the guiding light that we have um, as we're moving forward in this work is, um, and that is the, that is the standard that the Washington, Washington state has adopted and has directed Clark County to adopt as well. How we get there is up to, um, is up to this planning process and, and, you know, the future actions that people take. Uh, so next slide, please. This is, um, an overview of the, overall emissions uh, reduction planning process. And so um, we start with a greenhouse gas inventory, which you just saw. This helps us identify and quantify the local emission sources so that we know um, what is the most impactful and we can focus on those things and we can focus energy based on how impactful um, different, different sources of emissions are. And it helps us identify what the best um, potential emissions reduction 
um, options are. And sometimes you'll see the word mitigation in there that that's emissions reduction as well. Um, it's just another word for that. I thought I had changed that out of there, but I missed that one. Um, so the second part is to identify measures. And that's again with a focus in high impact sectors. Um, like I mentioned before, there are lots of proven and effective actions that can reduce greenhouse gases. And um, the primary focus <clears throat> for identifying actions is going to be on greenhouse gas reduction. But as we were talking about with things like, um, like farming, there are also co-benefits. So we want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and maximize co-benefits at the same time. Co-benefits include things like um, doubling as both a greenhouse gas emissions reduction measure and a resilience strengthening measure. Um, we could also see a co-benefit as improving um, human health or uh, ecosystem benefits, uh, creating jobs, things like that are, um, are considered co-benefits. So the consultant team, um, uh, my team with Claudia and, and others on our team, uh, we will be working to identify relevant and impactful actions, and then the CAG will review and um, uh, review those and provide suggestions. Um, and then they will finalize the prioritization criteria, and then we'll evaluate those things based on um, the the prioritization criteria. And then we'll bring it back to the groups to get feedback and more details about how um, uh, how implementation will matter for these different items. Um, and that's when we'll bring in the equity lens that you all have been working on developing too. So that's um, uh, the third part is evaluating the measures. That'll help us make sure that we are focusing on um, effective measures that are aligned with the priorities of the community um, and and that we're evaluating them using the equity lens to make sure that um, that we know the um, uh, the benefits and pitfalls of each action related to equity. Um, then we will work to, uh, set the emissions reductions targets based on those actions. And again, Washington has a statewide target of net zero emissions by 2050. And um, uh, our work will be to identify targets in each sector so that we can um, meet the overall target. And so we'll be looking at buildings and energy, for example, and say, you know, what are the milestones in bu buildings and energy and what are the milestones in transportation? And then our work will be to integrate and um, the measures into the comprehensive plan. And then, as I mentioned before, the greenhouse gas inventory will get updated regularly into the future to be able to track progress. And we'll be able to track that down um, downtrending number as a result of all of the actions. Um, so on the next slide, I'll show you an example of uh, another county and the emission reduction strategies that they adopted. So the strategies are rolled up of a bunch of actions. Um, so this uh, county um, uh, decided on a, f a few um, major categories of actions. And you can see the um, emissions reductions potential from those actions. Uh, starting at really strong um, and effective measures um, like like electric electric vehicle adoption and support of electric vehicles. And then you can see how um, the actions quickly taper off in, in their ability to reduce greenhouse gases. Um, still really important things to um, to include and to consider. Um, and also really important to keep in mind the overall um, emissions reduction potential of different actions. So we want to have a broad variety of actions that will address the variety of sources of emissions um, and also not get lost in thinking about and, and, um, and concentrating too much on actions that aren't as, as effective in reducing emissions. Um, because if we spend a disproportionate amount of time on the um, on the actions that 
have a, a lower greenhouse gas emissions reduction potential, um, then that means that we're not spending as much time on those ones that are larger and will have a greater impact on reducing emissions. Um, and so then uh, I have a couple examples on how these strategies are expanded a little bit to a variety of actions. So on the next slide, we have um, we have examples of electric vehicle action. So that was the um, top strategy uh, reducing 15.4 million metric tons of emissions um, over the course of about 20 years. Um, and that, that one for this uh, county that we worked with was broken out into these variety of actions. Um, and there are different things this is just to give you an idea of what sorts of actions we'll be looking at in the future, not to say that these are the exact ones that that um, Clark County will settle on. But there are different um, different ways, different roles that the county can have in um, in different types of actions. So there are some things that the county can take action on and it can actually uh, make a decision, make a policy, um, make a change in some way. There are other things that the county can promote through support of uh, another entity taking action. So uh, the, the county is not the only authority in uh, that covers where any one of us live. Um, so there are other entities that may also need to take action, but the county can definitely support. And then there are other places where the county can convene groups together to uh, create a forum to, uh, it, it's another way of support, right? So this is broken down in um, action, support, and um, convening roles. So for example, with electric vehicles, um, this county chose to replace all county-owned sedans with electric vehicles when vehicles reached their end of useful life. Um, and install charging stations for fleet and public use at county facilities and parks throughout the county. Uh, so, so we may see some sort of actions that um, resemble something like this. These are these are things that the county can can do. Um, the county can also support state and federal legislation or promote EV manufacturing. Um, those are all supportive actions because the county can't say you electric vehicle manufacturer must locate here because we want to reduce emissions. Um, but they could make it easy and pleasant for a manufacturer to to locate in the county. So just wanted to show a variety of actions here with um, electric vehicles. And then on the next slide, we have examples of um, active commute and telecommuting actions. And looking back at the, um, the list of strategies for this county, we went from 15.5 million, or sorry, 15.4 million metric tons for, with electric vehicles to these strategies in active commute and transportation amounting to 0 0.8 million metric tons. So still an important thing to do. Um, and, um, uh, you know, addressing a variety of, of things that the that the county has authority over. So, um, so one of them would be, for example, to implement a bicycle master plan, which would include um, ensuring that there are bike paths and that biking is easy and accessible to residents. Um, and that it, it it would be an easy choice for residents to um, ride their bikes instead of driving a car. Um, uh, the county could also evaluate how transportation infrastructure projects are prioritized with the goal of reducing emissions and integrating more equity into the process. So again, these are examples of how another county has um, integrated active commute and telecommuting actions um, into their into their planning process. Um, a supportive action, so something that the county doesn't have direct, of, direct control over but can, but can support is uh, broadband infrastructure expansion into rural areas. I think we saw a lot of this during the past um, infrastructure um, bills, a lot of uh, uh, broad, broadband expansion to allow people to, to work from home if they want to and not have to drive from those rural areas into the city to be able to access their their jobs. Um, and uh, a county could also uh, work with school districts on safe routes to school programs. So another supportive action that's not under the direct control of the county. And then the next slide is the final one that I'll, I'll touch on here with um, this other county example. 
And this is um, energy efficiency actions. Um, this one is 0 0.4 million metric tons to give you an idea of the, um, the overall impact. Um, <clears throat> but buildings and energy was one of the top um, one of the top emissions categories in Clark County. So this is an important one to make sure to cover as well. Um, so uh, the county could, for example, finance and implement cost saving energy efficiency projects such as lighting upgrades, HVAC systems and county buildings. Um, so or it could support uh, utilities in providing education about energy efficiency programs. Um, um, there's also this county chose to um, support the implementation of an energy efficiency policy like um, the Portland has a home energy score program, for example, um, so that people buyers would be informed about the energy usage of homes when they're buying and not get surprised by energy bills. Um, so these are all examples of energy efficiency actions. Um, Okay, so one, so we have lots of other examples of of other counties and cities and organizations, um, entities, uh, doing climate action planning <clears throat> and choosing and um, emissions reductions actions. Um, and so we will work from those to pull together um, options for Clark County to focus on, and one one other place that we'll be looking as we're pulling together this information is um, the menu of measures on the next slide. And I think you've heard um, Dana talk a little bit about the menu of measures. This is the um, curated list of sample emissions reductions actions, and it also has resiliency actions put together by the Department of Commerce. And so it's kind of like a shopping list. You can, you can read through it. It has lots of great ideas. Um, it has a lot of information already about um, potential actions that um, the county could take to um, uh, both improve resilience and and reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions. Of course, we'll be um, in this section, we'll be focused on the greenhouse gas emissions reductions um, available there. Uh, but we will definitely be looking at <clears throat> that resource to select actions that are aligned with the emission sources here in Clark County. Um, and then uh, the menu of measures is also really fun to look at. It has high priority policies based on effectiveness, co-benefits, potential to promote equity and justice, and other criteria. And so um, that'll be a great resource for us as well. And on the next slide, I have a couple of examples from the menu of measures. Um, so I just, I didn't want to repeat a lot of the other stuff that I had already um, listed from the other county example, but um, some of the examples that you can find in the menu of measures um, are to look at vehicle miles traveled, for example. Um, so implementing a travel demand management uh, program and strategy. Um, or creating safe, well-connected and attractive bicycle and pedestrian transportation network to encourage active transportation. So all of those would um, work to um, encourage people to take other forms of transportation and not uh, drive cars as much. Um, we talked about um, energy efficiency. So for the menu of measures, some examples in renewable energy and energy efficiency are to retrofit buildings for energy efficiency or require publicly owned buildings to be powered completely by renewable energy by a target date to be specified. Um, and you can find things like housing density, um, which would uh, a potential measure there could be to allow or encourage micro housing units. So these are just examples again of the sorts of things that we would find in the measure menu of measures and that we might be pulling from to um, to help address some of the um, key uh, emission sources in Clark County. So <clears throat> um, that is the high level overview of what um, emissions reductions planning is like, and some examples of um, actions that we may be talking about in the future, um, just to give you an idea of where we're headed with this part of the work. So I see Lavita has um, a hand up and I'm happy to take questions now. Awesome. Thanks, Tracy. Lavita, jump in. 
Okay, I and just it, had to unmute myself. So um, my question is like, where do you see an overlap in improving access to affordable housing and emissions reduction? Because I mean, right now there's like what a shortage to affordable housing or stability in housing. And yet like we don't wanna have too many materials in building and transfer, um, you know, transporting building materials. And so do you see an overlap coming out that is gonna produce more housing options? Uh, beyond micro housing, because I don't, I don't even really understand what that means, other than building something in your backyard to fit your family member in. Yeah, um, other examples of micro housing. Um, so it, it could be, it could be something in your backyard, but it could also be just uh, there are um, other strategies that might include things like um, allowing the zoning of um, traditionally single family housing um uh areas to allow for multiple units on the same plot of land um so sometimes that's a barrier we haven't looked into that yet in the county to see if that's an option um one um so one thing one direct area of overlap that um that affordable housing has with um, with greenhouse gas emissions reduction is that affordable housing tends to be um, apartments um, more than single family housing. And single family housing is um, much less energy efficient than multifamily housing. So apartments um, or townhomes or places where you have walls that connect because when you have walls that connect, um, heating and cooling, um, is is kind of maintained within the overall structure of the building, but when all of your walls face the outside, then you're um, then you lose a lot of the um, of the efficiency there. So that's one area where there is um, easy and easy to mention off the top of my head overlap. Um, so that's that's one area. Does that get to where you're going. Uh, yes. I mean, I was thinking more in terms of, there seems to be a movement towards, um, increased home ownership, especially among communities of color. Mm -hmm. And yet, and so I, I understand apartments cause that's, that's easy, but eventually mm -hmm. people want, want to have their own space for stability. So I guess I use affordable housing interchangeably with housings, like housing stability and just in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there might be, I don't, I don't know, this might be going back to your pieces, Claudia, around the assumptions made for type of housing that might be built, the construction materials, where they come from, the type of energy efficiency in new homes, right? So there might be some elements there. Was that, is construction itself part of the analysis? Like, so the building of housing over the course of um, uh, of time based on growth management or growth projections, those type of things. Is there, I guess I'm, I'm fumbling my question, Claudia, but it seems like it's connected to some of what- Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. No, uh, uh, all good. Uh, yeah, I'll add a little bit to what Tracy was saying. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be apartment that though that is you know a, a common one multifamily housing doesn't have to mean apartment it can be duplexes really anything that gets a kind of more dense housing right uh, instead of having one for example if you have a, an acre of land um the answer isn't going to be putting one tiny home on that acre of land instead of one mcmansion right if you will um, it might be more of making sure we get more housing units, a duplex, a quadplex, a larger apartment building. Um, but it's it's making sure that we have density because uh, density, generally speaking, you get smaller housing units because then you get into the less building energy needed, right? We saw building energy is basically tied for first place in terms of local emissions. Um, it reduces the amount of goods you need to fill that home, the amount of construction materials to build the home if it's a new home or renovation, maintenance, what, what have you. Um, you need less furniture to fill that home. And if we have more density, whether it's whether the housing size stays the same or not, if you have more homes on a single acre of land, you increase that from one to two, three, four, 
10. We don't have to get into apartments, but um, it also reduces your need for travel. So it can also reduce your transportation emissions. So it reduces land use change from right converting more acres outside of your community. There's there's so many benefits associated with density that are beyond um, the building energy needed. Um, and while I do think that apartments are a really great example, and um, it, it's not the only example, and, and certainly home ownership, I can agree, is an important uh, question and topic when it comes to housing. Um, there's home ownership models. Uh, there's home ownership opportunities with more dense housing as well, whether it's just on a smaller piece of land or a condo. Um, but density has many, many different GHG benefits, um, building energy, transportation, land use, and consumption emissions are kind of all tackled from more dense housing. That's great. And it sounds like to be continued, there's a lot of variables I think that are being named um, in, in yes. terms of the impacts. Laura, you had popped off mute. Were you wanting to jump in? Yeah, sorry, my dog did that. <laughs> Oh. And now I've lost my control panel and I'm not really sure how to get it back. <laughs> so I will work on that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, other questions for Tracy or what's coming up for you, Jude? Yeah, I was going to mm -hmm. um, take this opportunity to ask about the uh, natural gas versus electrification debate because it's on the street right now <laughs> and will probably be part of our our you know element here climate element but if you could because i see infrastructure natural gas infrastructure and i see electrification so maybe you can help us I, it, let's try to get to the is the question around the assumptions and the modeling around the the contributions, future contributions of natural gas and the infrastructure associated with, like, what's the, or is it really a policy question around, like, what's the assumption of policy around the longitudinal use of natural gas? Like, what's your kind well, of, the, yeah. There's an underlying, you know, scientific progress, progr projection question that is impacting policy. So, anyway, I just... Yes. So Claudia, I don't know, Tracy or Claudia, like, so how are you all kind of treating the natural gas conversation in context of what Jude's question is? Yeah, Tracy, I can get started unless you'd sure. like to take this one from the beginning. Okay. Um. So it, it's a little bit tricky to answer because uh, it, it's a, it's a, a popular topic and I don't want to get anyone into hot water and speak beyond but um, from a just a very clear GHG perspective um, I will say that natural gas being a fossil fuel source it's it needs to be reduced in order in order for us to meet a climate goal of net zero by 2050 for example uh, there is no place for natural gas as a fossil energy source if we're going to get to zero. Um, electricity, on the other hand, has great opportunity to be carbon free. Um, and in Washington, we have uh, the Clean Energy Targets Act, I believe it's called CETA, um, where we know that electricity is aim to be 100% carbon free at some point in time. Therefore, electrification is a great answer when we're talking GHG reduction. Um, that said, there's many kind of legal things and infrastructure things to talk about. Uh, we need to make sure that our community is ready for electrification. We need to figure out what to do with the natural gas infrastructure. This is where it gets a little bit more uh, challenging, but in terms of a plan to get to net zero by 2050, electrification seems to be a very obvious solution towards building energy. Does that provide a satisfactory answer? Well, it's a straightforward answer, Jude. Did you yeah. have any? Uh, that's like perfect, and and I think you know our job and in, into the future is is more like how do you make it socially environmentally juster yes the, the 
The one additional thing I think I will add is that uh, electrification is pretty straightforward when it comes to residential energy use and for the lar most part commercial as well. Industrial energy use is, is very different. They need different things. Um, and so there's some very cool innovations in terms of like renewable natural gas perhaps um, that are really interesting that there's a great place in industrial uses for, for those uh, solutions to go. We don't need renewable natural gas um, in every household, for example. It'd be better served in the industrial sector where they have a real need for uh, heat energy, for example, rather than electricity. And um, those solutions should also be investigated, but they might have a, a best use uh, for hydrogen, RNG, uh, other cool things that are coming up in the coming decades. That's great. Thanks for that, that question, Jude, and thank you, Claudia. Uh, Monica? Uh, yes, um, I would. I have a couple things, but on the it concerned me when I saw the natural gas infrastructure um, written down there uh, because I've actually been researching lately about uh, fracking and how you get the natural gas and there's water contamination, toxic chemicals, radioactive waste, community impacts. Um, also, groundwater pollution and depletion, air pollution and health impacts, lack of regulation, oversight, disproportionate impacts on marginalized communities, and dubious economic benefits. And um, I, I want to, I want to advocate for not using natural gas because of all the things that it does to the environment. Um, so thank you, Jude, for bringing that up. Um, also, I wanted to say about the support state and federal legislation to electrification of transportation. I think we need to do more than just support. I think we really need to like get down onto like that, that thing where like uh, it, it's also the other thing in the um, uh, 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 commerce where they said create a safe, well-connected and attractive bicycle pedestrian transportation uh, community. I really think we need to um, go hard on that. Um, and and with that, uh, the EV manufacturing, so what it takes to make an electric vehicle is so many resources from so many different places. And um, right now they're just starting to go on to um, uh, the new thing with the uh, sodium ion batteries. And so they're still creating the old ones with the lithium and everything. And I just, that is a huge climate footprint for the EV um, uh, vehicles. And so I want to really uh, advocate for more uh, communities that are like 15, 25 minute cities where we can actually walk or bike or rollerblade or whatever where we want to really get to. Um, and then with the support safe routes to school program, uh, there's one uh, thing that's over in Portland right now. It's called a bike bus, and it's where the students get like ride their bikes to school. But it's like they they go into a big group and a herd of bikes, and they pick each other up from each bus uh, bus stop, but with their bikes, and so the children get to exercise and also get to be together and go to school. Um, another thing I wanted to say was about the homes, the affordable homes. Um, ever since homes started being a commodity and started building and all this stuff like it just keeps on going up like there was one price back in the day for like for like probably a hundred or five hundred dollars and now all of a sudden it's like this crazy amount of rent and crazy amount for homes and it's like um these, these costs keep on going up and it's like oh we're just going to be more expensive more expensive I'm like but what about the cost of our health with having shelter my mental health is not doing well because of um, how high rent is, um, how I don't feel like I will ever be a homeowner. And also the the created um, uh, credit system um, that was created and is a construct. And I just feel like there's these, all these barriers that have been put in place to keep the little guy down and the big guys keeping on making their money. And I just really want to call that out because it's like, we if we don't, then we're just going to keep on doing the same things and just saying, well, this is the way it is, like, well, I mean, if we let it be this way. Um, and so uh, those were my main, oh, another one was that um, I wanted to know how to get information to uh, Claudia and everything. So I, I know I send my many emails to um, uh, Jenna, Amy, Ben, um, and, and uh, there, are eight, there are eight total that I send her to all the time. And so I just wanted to get Claudia's uh, email also so I could be sending hers as well. And anybody else needs to be sending uh, climate uh, 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 greenhouse gas reduction policies. Well, well, make sure you have um, 
contact information. And I guess, you know, maybe one, one of the things beyond, you know, I think there's, there's some visionary pieces, Monica, that you're naming and potential measures that could be included. And I guess the other thing that I'm hearing, I don't know what the opposite of co-benefits are. Maybe it's collateral harms. Um, is that part of the analysis, right? So I think Tracy, you had named, right. We're also going to look at co-benefits. Is there an other side of that coin analysis that happens as well? There, you know, there's um, for anything that maybe has a uh, we'd consider like a negative benefit, right? Like it's just it it maybe is um, doesn't move us in the benefit direction, right? So, um, you know that that'll come up in the analysis when we choose which um, actions it is that we're going to be anal well, I, analyzing I, I, further. Yeah, and I just, I mean, Monica, I think your example of electric vehicles, right? Like, so electrification of vehicles and moving a fleet from, you know, um, gas powered combustion to EV, depending on, right? If I hear you, Monica, depending on how that's sourced and how it's built and where the things come from and blah, 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 right? Then you, you know, I, I, it, there's there's other impacts, right? I, I think that's what I hear you you naming, Monica, is, is there's not these like silver bullets that are just kind of, um, that don't come with some potential costs or Claudia, your example of, you know, going full electrification and elimination of natural gas actually has some potential impacts if, if we're not considering kind of the wholeness of the story and the unique needs, for example, in your, your, your naming of industrial process. So. One thing yeah. I'll, yeah. one thing I'll add to that is um, consumption on the whole is we'll have, uh, will will cause harm, right? It'll cause emissions. It'll cause uh, environmental harm. Um, and so the the best thing is to reduce and eliminate consumption, right? Um, we still have needs that need to be met, and and a lot of times uh, in a lot of categories, we don't have the perfect thing yet, right? And so. Um, uh, part of helping us get to the um, the you know using all of these uh, constructs of markets that uh, Monica, as you would phrase it, um, is part part of part of the way that we can get to um, cleaner and cleaner um, options for the different things that we need to consume is to support the greener options. Um, so that they continue to innovate and they continue to um, to improve. And so, um, you know, lithium ion batteries, um, like we 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 wouldn't recommend not choosing an um, an electric vehicle strategy, for example, because of the liquid uh, the lithium ion batteries, um, because overall it's still way better than gasoline, um, and uh, showing strength in the market will help will help uh, spur that innovation that will help even those uh, products become cleaner and cleaner. So um, well, it's important to note what those um, uh, what those different impacts are and also keep our eye on the the um, the end goal, which is to uh, reduce emissions overall. Yeah, that's really that's really helpful. Thank you, Tracy. Monica, is that a new hand or your old hand? Me, me. I, I say no. It's my old hand. Also, I just wanted to say that I wanted to like simplifying our world and simplifying. Like we, I know all every single person in this room and I can can. I mean, in this meeting, can simplify the way of living so that we don't need to be using more and more resources. We need to really like like me and going to the grocery store. I read everything on the label now. It takes longer, but <laughs> but it is it's, it's something that we have to be conscious of because we want to we want to a beautiful world for us and for our kids and for future generations. So thank you. Thanks, Monica. Other questions for Tracy, because the other thing I want, you know, Tracy, maybe is worth walking through is kind of the sequencing of conversations. I know we have a timeline that um, might help folks kind of grapple with kind of the overall arc of, of discussion. But before we, we go there, um, are there any other comments, questions, reflections on the second part or or the first part of the presentation? And again, this is really a primer um, for today's purposes, kind of the introduction to the work, and we'll have, you know, certainly more discussions coming.
Okay, well, maybe that's worth flashing up and and Tracy you talking through kind of kind of how what's what's the upcoming uh, kind of trajectory that that we'll be on as as a group. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for all those great questions and conversation about uh, emissions and and all of the different things that we have to keep in mind uh, in in making the choices uh, that are coming up. So on um, the next slide, we have the upcoming meeting schedule. And you'll note that um, we have given you, in, uh, we gave you a schedule in the past. And so this updates that schedule. Um, and this is our, based on how everything's been going and, and, the, and the work that's in front of us. And uh, we've made a couple adjustments to um, really get what we think will be the best um, information from everybody and give everyone the best ability to contribute um, to the, to the both uh, greenhouse gas emissions reduction sub element and resiliency sub element. So um, we have, we have rows there for the EJC and the CAG, and we have uh, monthly meetings for each, um, you can see with a couple breaks built in. So those breaks typically um, are landing on um, federal holidays or or close enough to them that we believe that um, that people will be traveling by and large. Um, so we're here in July. We did our Climate 101 uh, greenhouse gas inventory and the emissions reductions process. Uh, we will provide the same information to the CAG this month. Then in August, what we want to do is bring to you, we wanna have a discussion about how you can talk about this with communities. Because as I mentioned, um, we want to help you identify um, things that are not only um, highly relevant to your communities um, and help focus people's attention to the things that, um, that are really relevant to them and impact their life. Um, and also the things that are really high impact. So when we saw that um, um, that table of emissions reduction actions, and you saw how quickly they kind of tapered off in their scale, um, we want to we want to have a conversation um, about how to get information from people that covers the broad spectrum of those emissions reductions activities. And that won't just focus on the things that are that have the lowest impact. That you're also having um, uh, discussions about the things that are really high impact, so that you can bring that conversation back to this group and help impact some of those items that are going to move forward as well. Um, so that's that's um, a little bit of the intent on an outreach discussion as you're engaging with outreach over the um, coming months. Meanwhile, with the CAG, we're going to start looking at some of the options for those um, key sectors, uh, buildings and energy, and then we'll start talking about the different prioritization criteria, how we'll uh, reduce a list from a lot of things to the number of things that we can actually analyze and study. Um, in September, uh, we will not meet together as, a, um, as an EJC. Um, you all will be uh, busy with your outreach, and we look forward to getting lots of great updates from you in October. Um, in September with the CAG, we're going to uh, get into some other sectors, consumption and waste and other miscellaneous things, and then transportation, um, so that we'll be covering the um, the spectrum of, of emission sources. And then once we have the information from the CAG and we've we've heard from them, we'll get your take on the different sectors. Uh, buildings and energy and transportation, and then in October, and then in November, we'll look at uh, consumption waste and other things. Um, and then in November and December, while uh, the CAG is on break, um, you will be will be running through um, the equity lens. We'll be running the equity lens through the um, through the actions, so that we can ensure that we're getting um, good feedback on on those actions that are moving forward and how they should be implemented and pros and cons and uh, things things to do, things to not do. Um, at the beginning of the year, uh, we'll have discussion with both groups on goals and targets, and uh, we'll, we'll have an overall discussion on emissions reductions measures and resiliency goals and policies. 
Um, and then in February, we'll be getting your, your final recommendations for the CAG from this group to be able to take back to the CAG in February. Um, and then uh, some discussion with the CAG in February. And then in March, um, the CAG will be finalizing their recommendations for both emissions reductions measures and resiliency policies. Awesome. Thank you, Tracy. So a uh, preview of uh, the next number of months in our shared lives uh, around this space. Any questions, reflections, comments on the timeline and topics? Yeah, Monica. Um, yes, I was looking at consumption and waste and I was trying to see if there was anything um, about like um, the, our poop, <laughs> the other things. <laughs> um, uh, um, um, trying to see if we can, you know, gather our, our waste like that and, and make it into something beautiful here. Um, I don't know if that's going to be anywhere on that. That would be included in waste. Awesome. Thank you. That's what I need to know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's not a way to drop poop in a meeting too, Monica. I appreciate that. That's, you know, keep us, keep us on our on our collective toes. Any other <laughs> any other questions for around kind of our process moving forward? Okay, and and we'll you know this again we'll we'll always be adjusting as we go along, and um, but this this will give you a sense of kind of where we're going and the sequencing of topics um, that builds on on what we just talked about tonight. Okay. Well, let's pause. It's a couple minutes early, but I did want to just reopen um, our public comment period, or I guess open up a public comment period. So this is a part of our agenda that we hold every um, Environmental Justice Coalition meeting for members of the public who would like to provide input to this group. So for those of you in the attendees joining, um, if you could raise your hand if you're interested in providing public comment, we will promote you to a panelist. And you'd get up to three minutes to provide input to the group. So again, those of you joining from the public, if you're interested in providing input, you can raise your hand and we'll promote you. I'll do the last call. Not seeing any hands raised, I'll close the public comment period. I uh, appreciate folks who, who joined, even if you didn't give uh, input today. We welcome you back. It's always welcome. Um, thanks for, for being a part of the discussion. And I think with that, we'll move into closing. Um, I don't know why I can't see my... Oh, there it is. I can see wrap up and next steps. That's We're right at the wrap up stage. So let's go to the next slide. So as we just saw, um, the uh, our next meeting will be in August. We'll provide some more information if, as, as that's coming out. And Tracy just shared kind of the journey that we'll be on. Um, you have gotten some, and Jenna, if I mistake any comments here, just correct me. Um, you have till July 12th to give feedback on stage uh, phase three engagement questions. So you all hopefully are in the habit of getting uh, um, and providing input on, on the engagement questions, um, ensuring that you all are keeping up with your work plans um, for July and August, and, and just make sure you're leaning on the team if you need, um, if you have questions that need to be asked or any support that's needed to, to make sure you're continuing the work that you've committed to doing. And then um, get paid. So submit your invoices. Um, and then uh, Jude, just want to lift up. Um, oh, that was just Grant. Sorry, I thought you put a new chat. We're just sharing. Good reminder. I'll make sure I remind folks at the beginning next meeting, change your settings to everyone. Um, so anything you put in the chat will be visible by the public. And do we have one last slide? Yes, our next meeting, August 5th. Um, so we'll send some more information. Um, we'll be focused uh, likely on engagement and outreach, but um, we'll we'll send you more information to help you prepare for that. As always, our Farm Health Justice uh, Coalition webpage will have information, updates, uh, meeting materials, et cetera. Um, and hopefully by now you know where to go, but for invoicing and work plans, uh, Lauren, Amy, Jenna, any other questions? Ben and Nicole. 
Jenna, any last thoughts for the good of the order? I want to thank you all for today um, for just good questions and um, and participation. Um, and I did want to mention we uh, look for Nicole's email that'll let you know those slides are posted and available. But if you need any of that information in a different format, please reach out to Lauren, uh, Amy, and myself. Um, we can if you need an award document or you want to make your own slides. Um, we we have all of that information that are in those slides. So. Um, uh, we know it's a, it's a lot of information, there's a lot of good information. Um, so, uh, yes, please feel free to reach out if that would be helpful. Awesome. Well, thanks, Thank Jenna. You. Thanks. Um... Clark County team, thank you, Claudia and Tracy, uh, for the great uh, presentation and primer today, for all y'all sharing and questions and comments and engagement work you're doing. Uh, really appreciate uh, being able to share the space with you. So I'll give you 20 back, uh, 20 minutes back in your life. I hope folks, uh, whatever you do for uh, this holiday, to enjoy it, be family, friends, fireworks, whatever's in, in your world, um, enjoy it. And we'll see you next month. Appreciate you all. Have a wonderful night. Take care.